You've tuned into another edition of The Break Room, a weekly conversation about how the city of St. Augustine works from those who do the work every day. Hosted by the city of St. Augustine's communications director, Melissa Whistle, The Break Room offers a closer look at the different city departments and provides updates on current and upcoming projects and events. And now your host, Melissa Whistle. Welcome to The Break Room. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Melissa Whistle, communications director for the city of St. Augustine. This week in the break room, I've invited Jenny Wolf, the city's historic preservation officer, to join us and talk about the recent open house event at the historic Waterworks building. The structure was closed to the public in 2005, and now 16 years later, it's been restored, repaired, renovated. Jenny, welcome back, and that's quite an undertaking. It is, and it's been the best thing that I've been able to be a part of so far. I'm just so excited for it. It was a great night. The the building was beautiful, and I will admit, I was there with you just a few <laughs> days prior, and I was a little panicked. Yeah, tell, tell us about it. Tell us about the building, up. the project. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Well, first of all, I just want to say thanks to everyone who came out. We had almost 200 people. Wow. So we had an open house Great. from 3 to 5 for people just to come in and see it, share their memories. Um, we actually had a woman whose grandfather was the original first engineer of the building who worked wow. there until 1917. And so he got, she went and stood in the office where he worked, that's, which has now been And that's what it's restored. all about. So yeah, that was, Telling that was those pretty stories. awesome. Mm-hmm. Wow. So yeah, in fact, um, at that time, the da- that wasn't even called Davenport Park. Okay. So we did have a city pumping station first installed, a whole city waterworks facility installed by 1898. The land was conveyed to the city by Henry Flagler. He did not build the building, but he conveyed the property to the city for the express purpose of developing a water utility, which obviously we could see his need to benefit for his hotels. But the city had also experienced some recent fires, and so there was definitely a need for it. So it was built, but then, uh, let's see, 20, 20, 30 years later, Mm -hmm. uh, the West King Street station opened and made the building defunct. And the city decided at that time to adaptively use it as a community center. Okay. And at that time, uh, incidentally, there was a woman whose father had been in in and out of St. Augustine over his life. When she died, she left money to the city to to name it Davenport Park after her father. Cool. And so that's where we got the name name. Davenport Park. Okay. So the building would become the Davenport Park Clubhouse. And during that time, the St. Augustine Arts Club was there, which is now the St. Augustine Art Association. Okay. And then it became the Saint, uh, the Davenport Park Playhouse when the Little Theater was there oh. for a really long time. And what's been really neat to see some more stories coming out of the woodwork. Uh, we always knew that there were stories there to be told because we've seen the graffiti up in the attic in the old dressing rooms. But I got to meet with a woman who actually has the scrapbook from the Little Theater days between 1939 and 1959. Yeah. Wow. So I got a lot of great information. And what a neat, what a neat, as you said, kind of coming out of the woodwork, I'll call it coming out of the mortar (laughs) because it's a brick building. But what neat histories more than just the the brick and mortar of the building, but those personal stories, the the true history of our community. It is, and it's been a part of our community in some shape or form since that time, even though it had, you know, beginnings as a utility center. Even at that time, we have postcards from people who were visiting the water facility and saying they're pumping, you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water to the city every day through this artesian well. So it was even a gathering spot then, and it be, still remained a gathering spot. And uh, even through the Garden Club's use of the property up until it closed in 2005. So we are very anxious to see it become a more active use back into our community for our community, visitors and residents alike. Right. And just real quick before we move on that, you have... But there were pictures at the open house. We have pictures. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had a presentation. We could probably get that on the website. Absolutely. Yeah. But but the you mentioned the people sitting around. The the park has really evolved from being, like you said, a gathering space, and then we added on another part of the building Mm -hmm. that was sort of like. An addition to the building? Yes, it was an addition. So with historic preservation, you have to do things in a compatible way. We don't want it to look like it was originally part of the building. 
So we worked closely with the state on the design of the addition, but we weren't able to, wouldn't have been able to install bathroom facilities that meet current code, the ADA requirements to meet current code in the historic part of the building without compromising its integrity. So we designed the addition with the architect team at Bender and Associates and got that constructed. And uh, so it's a fully operational facility once we get FBL yeah. back from Louisiana. Right. Um, so we're still, you know, caring for those folks out there. But once they get back, we'll finally be able to get some of the other finishing touches done. And there was there was quite a bit to the building. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, like the, sure. the structure, the sure. windows? There, mm-hmm. there was a lot going on there. There's a lot. So if you walk in the main door right now from uh, the parking lot, you walk in the entry vestibule and you walk into the auditorium space. Well, imagine in 2009 that the whole space was covered in scaffolding because the city had determined that there was too much weight being put on the brick walls. The mortar had actually reduced to like chalk. There were piles of mortar dust on the floor. So uh, the city installed scaffolding to hold up the roof in the meantime until we could secure some funds uh, to start renovating the building. Then once you walk towards the back of the room, uh, back in the days of the Garden Club, uh, the whole floors in the back have been covered with tile. They had a 1970s addition that has some storage area. Um, and then also that what I was calling the engineer's office is that bay-shaped space that faces San Marco Avenue. That had become bathroom facilities, uh, which wouldn't meet modern code space-wise nowadays. Uh, so it's just open space right now. Um, and then upstairs in the attic, it's it's just really exposed timbers. Right. But now they've been fully insulated, and uh, the integrity of those structural members has been reviewed by the engineer from Atlantic Engineering. So it's good to go. But now when you walk in there, it's this fully open space. The trusses have been reconstructed, and the original floor material in the back, those hexagonal concrete right. tiles. It's really cool. That are really cool, and they were made locally by the North City Stoneworks facility, oh, wow. which was right nearby um, where Davenport Park is today. But um, we think they were made locally, and according to the 1896 engineering specifications, it actually spelled out those hexagonal tiles being used on the floor of the pumping station. Wow. So it goes back to that time, just like the ceiling that's green. That green seal zinc is spelled out in those 1896 specifications. So So, it's really neat to put those pieces together. And it 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 stays authentic. Exactly. And speaking to that, I just can't shy away from telling you this story because it caused some kind of momentary panic attack. (laughs) (laughs) I'm in the building when they're getting ready. They're tearing up the what was the current concrete floor, which had no historic value. But in order to put in a flat and stable surface that was level, uh, they had to take up that concrete layer to lay a new concrete floor. Well, once we took that up, we discovered what we think is the original or at least the 1928 floor of the building. And it was incidentally a a coquina concrete, which is what we were going to come back with anyways. Okay. But we had no idea because the floor in 1928 drawings said it was going to be terrazzo. So we found that and I'm like, oh, everybody stop. Stop. (laughs) Can we scrape away all this dirt? Can we just use this floor? And so that's when you call a friend called Roxanne Horvath to call you, call you, bring you down off the wall. (laughs) Off the ledge. Just calm down. Off the ledge. And, um, we decided to document and move forward because we did need to have a floor that met ADA requirements. Right. But we recognize that a lot of people in our community work with historic buildings and you have these unintended surprises that come out and you just have to deal with them along the way. And to, so to speak about um, Commissioner Harvath, lot, took a team of folks. Yes. Lots of people. It did. And I think what we really were recognizing at the open house and the appreciation picnic was the work of the craftsmen, many, many craftsmen over the last at least seven, eight years that mm-hmm. we've been under construction for the building. Um, from the folks with Damari Construction, you know, initially I was working with Frank and then with Charlie Owens. And then with Zach Oliveira and Blair Revels, those guys were there every day making sure that all of the various contractors for MEPs 
and the fire utilities and all of those systems were being uh, put in place, but also the plaster restores, the paint finishers, um, the floor finishers, like all of those things had to be managed uh, by a team and it takes craftsmen. And unfortunately, we don't have as many craftsmen as we'd like, and which, you know, was kind of scary as, as far as pulling our timeline together because you had COVID right. that impacted some folks on our group and um, also just the many jobs. Construction is yep. is really in at demand, a high level here. Right, in demand. Mm-hmm. And then that's all the inside of the building. Let's give a shout out our our city staff, public yes. works, streets and grounds, all the teams that got the outside looking so beautiful. Yeah, how it was about a little bit of a sore. A it was a little bit of an eyesore for a while. I got to admit, <laughs> it was. It's been boarded up. It's had a chain link fence around it. Um, it's had broken uh, sidewalk areas, and it was really disconnected from the rest of the park. When actually that building was the start of the focal point of the entire park. So mm-hmm. now it's been reintroduced back to the park. Chain link fences down. We have new sidewalks. And again, thanks to our crews who came out and did yeah. tree trimming, uh, flattening out uh, some of the dirt piles, stacking bricks, sodding some areas and throwing sidewalk. down. Sidewalk was my, pa- my, pa- my panic attack on Friday. <laughs> sidewalk, no big deal. We can do that in a day, sure. It's fine. <laughs> They're miracle workers. It looked, it looked beautiful. Yeah. Um, just real quick, if you're just now tuning in, you are listening to The Break Room. Uh, I'm Melissa Whistle, Communications Director for the City, and today I'm talking with Jenny Wolf, the City's Historic Preservation Officer, about the Historic Waterworks Building. And just quickly here before we we have to sign off, what's next for the building? I know that's a big question in, my, in people's minds. Everybody wants to get their hands on it. Everybody yes, loves it. Yes, yes. And I think that was one of the great things that we got to hear from people during the open house and the evening was everyone could see the potential. I mean, a lot of times when you go in an old building, people don't see the potential. Now it's clear and we have a lot of people that are interested. But really what we're going to present to the commission are some choices that we've evaluated over the many years from either a solicitation open to the public, but tell us if you want a civic or a commercial use So then it would be managed by a private entity, uh, maybe a nonprofit. Um, Do we direct negotiate with the county? Is there a county need for a facility space there? Um, Or do we direct negotiate with someone else who has approached the city? Um, Or there's always the option of the city running itself. Uh, We have the Gallimore Center. um, And is there capacity for the city to operate a dynamic space in the building, uh, much like the Gallimore Center, but in a different capacity with uh, the Waterworks building. We right. just we just don't know, but those are the questions we're going to be asking the city commission to give their feedback on, so that we can make those next steps. And there is going to be a commission meeting on uh, September twenty seventh, five p.m. Yes, we we agenda invite, permitting <laughs> exa- agenda permitting. We are inviting the public to offer public comment on Absolutely. something like this because that helps hopefully helps you know the commission see what the community wants. Yes. So yes. Well. The, what exciting! It was an exciting event. Um, if anybody missed it, you you've missed. So keep stay tuned um, for anything next. I know you did some open houses. I don't know that we'll see any more. Will we see any more open houses? I I don't think so from okay. the city necessarily. Yeah. I feel like we did. This was our last construction open house. Yeah. Um, I've done about four of these. Luckily, this was the first time we could have the lights and the AC on. So yeah. that was pretty special. Uh, But the next time I anticipate that we'll do, you know, there would be a ribbon cutting, say everything is done and we have a new person that's going to steward this building um, still under city ownership, but whether it's city directed or a private entity, um, we look forward to that coming along. And um, I just want to give a thanks out again to our sponsors for Tuesday's event uh, because we had the Citizens for the Preservation of St. Augustine help us out as well as the Nancy Sykes Klein Trust. And Dog Rose Brewery was yep. there. Uh, so we had uh, great support from the community to, to put that event on. So we thank everyone that made it a, a success. And before we sign off, thank you for all of your <laughs> hard work. Your your love and dedication to what you do is very apparent in, in the job well done at the event. So thank you. It's my pleasure. 
And with that, we will sign off. If you've missed a part of this broadcast and want to go back and listen from the beginning or you want to hear any past interviews, you can find us on the web at citystanogradio.com. We want to keep you informed about what's happening in and around the city and most importantly that you hear it here from the people doing the work and making it happen every day. Remember that in order to stay connected, you need to be connected. Be sure to like us and follow us on any of our social media platforms. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at City St. Aug. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time. You've been listening to The Break Room, a weekly program addressing projects and programs offered by the City of St. Augustine. Join us each week as the City's Communications Director, Melissa Whistle, has in-depth conversations with the people who make our town work to meet the needs of our community. The Break Room is produced by Communications Specialist for the City of St. Augustine, Cindy Walker. See you at this time next week for another edition of The Break Room.